Okay, we're, we're going to start. Um, well, welcome to Gamification in, in the Workplace. This is one of, uh, of several or of many webinars that Galvin Technologies will be putting on. I'm Gary Galvin. I'm president and founder of Galvin Technologies. Um, we're really glad that many of you have decided to spend your morning with us. And uh, we're really glad to also have Bob Marsh with Level 11 join us as well. Um, just a couple housekeeping things. This webinar um, is scheduled to be a half hour long. And throughout the webinar, uh, if you should have questions or comments uh, over in your uh, GoToWebinar panel, there will be a, a question area. We'll be monitoring that, and we'll be asking, uh, and we will relay those questions over to Bob or myself. Um, and then there will be time at the end of the webinar for everybody to ask more questions. So upon further ado, we're going to go ahead and start. Um, I want to first dive into and just spend a little bit of time, um, just a quick minute or so, talking about Galvin Technologies. Galvin is a web and software company, and there's really four main areas to what we do. We do website solutions, we do inbound marketing, we do software application development and custom software application development, and then we have a CRM practice group that does salesforce.com. Everything that we do uh, focuses on a model that we call the customer experience management model, or, or CXM, which is all about how do you attract people into a website, how do you convert them, and then how do you get them into a CRM so that ultimately you could retain them, whether it be through sales efforts or through uh, improved marketing automation and email marketing efforts. One of the, um, one of the services that we provide is salesforce.com. And with, with many of our Salesforce implementation projects and development projects, um, one of the biggest issues that we've seen has been um, related to, um, to adoption. And um, we get involved with many clients who, who come to us because either their Salesforce instance is purchased but not being used by everybody, or the data within their Salesforce environment isn't exactly um, clean. So what we've seen is we've seen that by incorporating um, accountability into, uh, it, into the Salesforce instance has really improved um, uh, the usage of many of our accounts in, in, in using Salesforce.com. And one of those big things that we always come back to is gamification. So it always started with, with, with gamification. And what gamification is, is integrating game dynamics into your workplace to drive participation and to motivate high value activity. We started at Galvin Technologies with gamification techniques for our sales team for the sole purpose of making sure that the information that's within salesforce.com is accurate. Um, so for example, a few years back, we incorporated a point system which is essentially um, all based off of activity. And, and it goes back to a saying that my dad had, uh, or that my dad said to me a long time ago, which was, from a sales perspective, which was activity equals money. And, um, and if salespeople are doing the right types of activity, the money and the numbers and, and meeting the quota will follow. So how do you make sure that the right types of, of activity is being done? So at Galvin Technologies, we have a system that, um, that we incorporated about oh, four or five years ago, which was essentially you have your quota that you have to meet every month, but you also have to reach 110 points in activity. Now, I'm not going to dive into that too much right now because I want to make sure we spend a lot of time talking about um, what Bob Marsh has, has, has to offer, but that's where gamification started with us, and it really drew activity, and it really improved the data. Um, Gartner... Um, who's always a reliable source, Gardner identified four principal means of driving engagement um, using gamification. And those four um, areas, and Bob's going to touch on many of these, are accelerated feedback cycles, clear goals and rules of play, a compelling narrative, and tasks that are challenging but achievable. And Bob's going to be talking about many of this. Um, but, but one of the, the biggest things that we see um, at Galvin Technologies and, and within the industry is that what's called that discretionary performance. 
So there's a graph that's out there that we've seen, which is you have your time graph, and then you got the, the performance line. Well, there's always that line that is, what does your employees have to do over time to do the minimum requirements to get by? But as sales managers, we always try to strive for what do we want them to do. So there's a big dis there's a big discrepancy between those two lines, and this discrepancy is called the discretionary performance. What everybody wants to know is how do we achieve this discretionary performance, that of which would make people go above and beyond what they're supposed to do to meet what the managers want them to do. And if we're able to improve this area, this, this green area, um, it will pay you back. So I'm going to segue into the presentation that everybody has, has, uh, has showed up for, and that's with, and that's with Bob Marsh. And Bob Marsh um, and I got connected um, a while ago through social media, and the reason is that I was attracted to Level 11 is because of the gamification that they were putting in place. And I'm excited to have Bob Marsh join us and talk about some of the philosophies that him and his staff have been able to um, uh, gain over the years, but also share with us um, a little bit more about Level 11. So, Bob, I'm going to turn this over to you to take control. Great. Well, thanks, Gary. Uh, so it's, it's excellent background and kind of set up so a lot of things we're going to talk about. And it's, uh, it, it's really exciting to see so much attention and interest in this, uh, in this new emerging category in gamification. And so the research that you just showed and certainly the response that we've gotten in terms of participation here is, uh, is just great to see. So, so thanks, everybody, for, for taking a few minutes to uh, sort of learn a little bit more. Um, you know, whenever I, uh, whenever I kind of sit in on these presentations, a uh, conference or webinar, I'm always curious to just know a little bit more about the, the, the folks that are talking kind of personally. So, um, so I'll give you a little bit of my, my background. So personally, I, I live in metropolitan Detroit, um, married. I've got three kids, a six-year-old boy, a three-year-old daughter, and a six-month-old son. So it's a, it's a busy time in the Marsh house, house but we're, uh, we're adjusting <laughs> nicely. Um, Actually, uh, I was born here, but I grew up in Orchard Park, New York, which is just outside of Buffalo. So I was a huge Bills fan um, during, a, uh, during an exciting time, although a little disappointing time in some ways, our poor Super Bowl run. Um, and then uh, I went to college at, uh, at John Carroll, which is just outside of Cleveland. Uh, I played in the college golf team, so kind of tapping into this, some of that competitiveness uh, competitive of, of my own. So, and then uh, now, again, as I mentioned, I'm back in Metro Detroit. So I've kind of been going around Lake Erie, it seems like. Um, so professionally, um, I, I've spent most of my career, 18 years, a little over 18 years now, um, specifically in sales and in sales management. Um, and uh, I came up with this idea around Level 11 um, and, our, and our Compete app for Salesforce uh, when I was implementing Salesforce at my prior company. Uh, and we launched the beta version of it, which is just a little bit of a side project, uh, back in September of 2011, about, uh, about 18, a little over 18 months ago. Um, and based on its very rapid early success, um, we, we decided to kind of spin it out, raised about a, a million and a half dollars in venture capital, um, and we launched as its own business, uh, standalone company, Level 11, um, just about uh, seven months, eight months ago in October of 2012. And we're, we're headquartered right in uh, downtown Detroit. I'm sitting in our office right now looking right over at, uh, looking right over at Comerica Park where the, where the Tigers play. Now, Bob, within Detroit there, this is actually, this is a big, um, startup community that is happening there, correct? Yeah, it's really exciting what's going on here. I mean, there's um, we're, we're in a building called the Madison Building, which is kind of often hailed as kind of the, the little bit of a technology hub in, in the city here. Um, and there's a, there's a, there's a, people have heard, and it's not inaccurate, I mean, a lot of the, the rough times that, that Detroit has had, um, and we're really working to get out of that. And so one of the, you know, the very strong beliefs from the business community is that um, entrepreneurship and, and particularly technology businesses will be a, a major driver to help pull us out of this. And so, um, so yeah, we're, we're based here in Detroit. We're in a uh, our venture capital firm, um, our lead venture capital firm is Detroit Venture Partners, um, and we're in their building right here downtown um, with uh, with about ten other technology startups as well. So it's a, a lot of energy going on in the city right now. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So, so um, you know, continuing on, so I, I would kind of step back a little bit, and, and a lot of the work that we have done, although it's been in other categories that I'll touch on, has, has mostly been in the in the world of sales. Uh, a lot of it because that's, that's where my background lies. Um, there's something that I, I call the sales manager's challenge, um, which is that managers you know, really struggle to get their teams to focus on the right things. And, 
and uh, and Gary, you kind of touched on this with the discretionary performance gap, which kind of nailed it. Um, there's actually been some um, some recent research that, that uh, CSO Insights did that kind of further validated this, and it's actually the number one challenge that sales managers have is that how do I get my people to focus on the right behaviors? Like that's the struggle. And so if you think about it, what happens is the salesperson, like their compensation plan, um, rewards them for selling, and rightfully so. I mean that's that's really what it should be focused on. But then day to day, as a manager, uh, you spend your time coaching and cajoling and inspiring and trying to motivate people around the activities, things like, you know, I, you know, let's go make more calls or you know, go find more sales opportunities. Let's bring new products to market. You know, follow up on on the leads that we're getting. Uh, meet with clients. Take your existing opportunities and forward them and move them through the sales process faster. And of course, you know, close deals. And so these are the things that managers often spend their time coaching and working with their teams on to find those best practices so that they can copy them. And really, this is the vision that, that people have when they go to implement a, a sales CRM system, like a Salesforce or an Oracle or Sugar or Microsoft, like whatever, whatever it might be. Um, and the, and the, the hope is that you're going to get this perfect visibility into your sales organization so that you're not just tracking orders, which is what typically what happens, and rather, you're monitoring and measuring the different leading indicators, the things that I just talked about, the calls, the meetings, the taking product, et cetera, um, under the, the, the hope and the idea that if you can measure it, you're going to be able to motivate it. And that's really what, you're, what, what people are investing, you know, thousands of dollars, in some cases millions of dollars, on that exact vision. But, you know, one of the things that I personally faced, and I knew I wasn't alone here, is that after I had spent a lot of time implementing Salesforce, you know, within this past sales organization, um, and spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on that is that you know there's still the challenge with like how do I drive day-to-day -day usage and most importantly you know I find my, saw myself and this is kind of like my moment when I started thinking about this new business was that you know I've got this amazingly powerful engine in Salesforce where now I have incredible data at my fingertips and I, you know I, I can see you know that we're making you know that we're, we're our, our, our salespeople are logging their meetings like we're getting meetings with clients and I have that data but how do I get them to get to go find more meetings? I see that we're, you know, leads are coming in. I'm tracking it through our CRM system, but how do I get my salespeople to respond to them faster? You know, we're pitching new products and we're taking them to market, but how do I get my team to do it more often? And that's really like the, the CRM system gives you the database and systems to report on it, but as a manager, I was still struggling with, well, how do I make this stuff happen more so that I can that I can grow our, our organization? So Separately, when you look at a salesperson, so the Aberdeen Group just a few months ago came out with some research about what motivates salespeople, um, and a lot of it was focused on gamification, which was really interesting, of course, to us. And so, um, the, what they found is that you know when you put the money part aside, um, which is obviously a, a huge driver. I mean, these are people that are in this profession because they want to be held accountable, and then you know they're willing to kind of bet you know some of their income on it. Um, when you put that part aside, the two biggest motivators for salespeople are, number one, is recognition for positive performance and competition with other team members. And so this isn't, of course, specific to salespeople. Like, you know, everybody motivates, like everybody wants to be recognized and, you know, people generally like to compete. Um, it tends to be a little bit more acute and specific with, uh, with salespeople, but, you know, our, our company in particular, I mean, we've been, you know, we do a lot of work in the sales world, but we've seen these exact same things and with clients that are trying to motivate you know, customer service teams, or you know, we're even running a program with a um, with a with a hospital who's trying to motivate their their nurses to pay uh, better attention, to better better care around how they um, how they follow procedures to prevent infectious disease. Like these same concepts work kind of across the, across the board. But interesting research here, specifically in sales. So so Bob, I mean, what's interesting about this chart and about what you've said there is that you know, it almost seems like that we as as humans, it's in our DNA to compete. I mean, we want to be recognized and we want to compete. I mean, and I think this is some of the points that we've seen here from the Aberdeen Group. Yeah, that's right. I mean, this is kind of validating. I mean, a lot of people kind of feel and sense this, but, you know, this, this is why if you look at the idea of, you know, take the old-fashioned sales contest, you know, a little contest that companies do internally, like, that's why those things exist. But, you know, because you're trying to tap into that as much as you can because it is just a, 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 a it's a human motivator. Um, but also, it's fun. I mean, it creates some energy and excitement within an organization, and that's part of the, you know that's part of what what uh, man, as managers people are trying to do is like, how do I add more energy and excitement to my uh, to my culture? And this is one of the ways to do it. Yeah, it's kind of like when we were kids. I mean, um, with with my brothers and sisters, we could go outside and 
and play a game, but the moment that we start keeping score, it's a whole different ball game now. You know, yeah, it I mean, changes, and it doesn't game. like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it doesn't like you know it doesn't mean like people get you know crazy like pitting against each other, but it just makes it a lot more interesting, and you start maybe getting a little bit more focused on the on the on the right area. So that's exactly the idea. Oh, good. Yeah. So so I thought I'd share. I have a few specific stories or case studies I think are that kind of best exemplify this, and and hopefully folks out there you know may see similarities that they could apply some of these same ideas within their own organization. So. So the, the first one, this is, um, this is Jen Gray. She's the VP of Marketing over at ePrize, which is a, a technology company based on Detroit. They're about a 500-person company. Um, and the challenge that she was seeking, that she had, is that you know, she's looking for ways to increase sales leads. Like that's kind of the main function, increase leads for the sales team. Um, and one of the ideas that she had, which has actually started within the, within the, from the salespeople who said, you know, gosh, it'd be great. We have all these amazing clients. Like could we figure out a way to kind of use that to generate case studies but then we can use those to go chase down new prospective customers and say, hey, look at all the experience we have in your industry. And so Jen was like, great, you know, we got Salesforce now, I can track all this, I can easily pull an email list, and I can kind of blast it out. Um, so she goes to do that, and she instantly sits down and says, oh my gosh, less than half of the accounts we even have in Salesforce have the industry filled, filled out. So she's kind of sitting on her hands and can't get this, this program in place. And so for many months, she tried encouragement of like, hey, you know, I want to get this plan in place, can you you know, please update that field, you know, you know, et cetera. And it just kind of, it just wasn't happening. So we came up with this idea for a little competition around it that we simply called Industry Quest. And the idea was to just to tell salespeople, hey, go into Salesforce, go into your accounts, and, and update that industry field. Just put in the industry data. Um, and every time you do that, you'll get one point. And whoever gets the most points will win. And it was as simple as that. And then what we would do is on a daily basis, we'd send out a little email leaderboard to say, hey, here's where everybody stands. And so this would just kind of pop in their inbox in the morning, and the idea was we we're trying to tap into that competitiveness. And you know, a lot of times what companies will do is they'll they'll announce a little contest, and you know, it sounds great, but then the, and when they get to the day-to-day -day realities of managing it, you know, no one knows exactly where they stand because you know they don't take the time to to kind of alert people on their standings on a regular basis so they can take action on it. So that was the hey, idea Bob. of the email. Here. Hey Bob, you're in fifth place. Yeah, I know. I gotta, I gotta, got some you gotta work pick to it up a little bit, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, um, so this is what we saw. So, um, when we announced this little competition, there were 60 accounts that were updated within within two hours. Um, the next morning, uh, we sent out that email update that I just showed you, and by the end of that day, over 300 accounts were updated. In a matter of 10 days, over 1,400 accounts had their industry fields updated. And so, if you look at this, and so that's the, which ended up getting us to about 87% of all the accounts had the industry field filled out. So we went from less than 50%. To over eighty to over eighty seven percent within a matter of ten days, and if you look at this graph, you see the you know we just grabbed we could have gone farther back and it didn't change much, but in the weeks these are you know right here this is where Jen is going out and going to team meetings and asking people to help me out and get this field filled out and it'll, it'll help me get more leads and people understand that in concept, but then they go back to their desk and they just say okay well you know I get sucked into what you know the next thing I need to do and they never make it a priority, and so when we add a little competition around it look at what happens. So that's that's exactly the idea. Because this is what, this case in particular, it's not hard. It's just a matter of how do I get people to do something that they wouldn't normally do otherwise. Um, Bob, there's a question the, that just came in. If you want to go back to that slide, there's a question that yeah. just came in, which is, it talks that you talked about showing the the leaders. Is there a benefit to also showing those who are on the bottom? Uh, yeah, I think there is. I mean, it's just it's a matter of uh, full transparency. And so, you know, we, we uh, what we do is we'll, you know we'll have uh, we'll use leaderboards, and it'll kind of display here's the here's just a straight ranking from top to bottom. Um, you do want to be you know aware of the fact that you know some, you know when people when you have a large large leaderboard, um, you know it can could be discouraging to the folks at the bottom. So we generally recommend to our clients, you know, if you're going to have if you're going to include a large amount of people, say more than 50, you may want to consider breaking it up into smaller groups. Um, and then also you might consider saying, all right, if I'm going to, you know, some people worry that if I have a leaderboard where, you know, my top performer is just going to run away with it. And we look at saying, well, let's just kind of separate them out and have one competition for your top performers, another for the mid performers, another for the bottom. And then what that does, it gets people competing with people that are more similar to them. But most importantly, at the end, if you tally it all up, everybody collectively would have, would have done more than they would have otherwise. So it's like a handicapping golf. Yeah, it's the same same concept. Yeah. Exactly. So 
Well, Bob, there's another question that just came in, which might be a nice segue into your next slide. So you just showcased some of the results and and just you know um, asking people to update the one field. So a question that came in is, what was the prize? Yes, yeah, so this is uh, this was hilarious. So the grand prize was a ten dollar gift card to Starbucks. Wow. And so what's uh, what's amazing about this is that you know what we found is that you know the the competition is what motivates people. It's not the prize. And a lot of times I see in here managers get a little bit overly concerned about you know what can I give away to make it interesting. Like if I'm dealing with salespeople, some of these are people that make a lot of money. Like how do I make this interesting to them? And what we found is that if you run these games and these competitions effectively with things like real-time leaderboard updates and regularly keeping them updated where they stand through those emails and like it always being aware, like those mechanics, when you get those in place, it makes the prize that much less important because it's the competition that motivates people, not just what they're going to get at the end. And we hear that time and time again. And this, this is one example of it. So another story I'll share uh, locally here uh, here in Detroit, uh, one of our clients is the Detroit Pistons. And so this is Scott Holland. He's the manager of the sales analytics team. and so. His challenge was that um, so that the Pistons were a couple of years ago where, where a new owner came in and uh, made some just massive investments in the uh, in the arena itself and so um, they they redid all of their suites and um, they came out with a new product which was that allowed people to buy a, a single a, a, a suite for a single game so you know it doesn't have to be like you know long term contracts a company or even a group of people could just rent a suite for a game and so it seems like a very natural great idea but the problem was that. You know, they made this available, but the sales team wasn't pitching it. And this is not an uncommon scenario, that a new product comes out and salespeople kind of hold back because they're not sure, like, how clients are going to respond to it. And, you know, they don't want to look dumb when they bring it up. And what kind of objections are they going to face? And are people going to ask, you know, you know, what kind of return am I going to get on it, that kind of stuff, and they want to answer. And so, you know, what they'll do is they'll sit around and wait for they'll sit around and wait for someone else to sell it, and then they'll start doing it. And so Scott said, well, we got to change this. Like, we need to get things going. And so... They ran a little competition. You know, they used our our, our our leaderboard, which looked something like this, so the people always knew exactly where the, exactly where they were at any moment. Um, they actually did a single competition across the entire board, which got them interesting versus doing the kind of A performer, B performer, C performer group, which made a lot of sense in this case. So the results were were really exciting. So they went for for they went from almost nothing for months. Like people just were not even pitching it, let alone selling it. Um, within a matter of six weeks, they got over $500,000 in sales of this product, which represented their six-month goal. So for the entire year, they were hoping to sell, they were hoping to sell a million dollars in, in, this, in this product, and they sold half a million just in a matter of six weeks. And so that was kind of what was exciting for them because the idea was that it got people changing their habits. When they started seeing and hearing their peers selling this product and seeing it up on the leaderboard, what they did is they started collaborating more. And so someone who's maybe maybe at the middle or the bottom of the leaderboard, what they did is they were starting to ask their peers and those at the top to say, hey, tell me more about how you're doing that. How are you pitching it? What kind of feedback are you getting? And so what happened is, you know, even the folks at the so the folks at the bottom were just kind of duking it out with each other, which then meant they were selling more than that any than anybody else. And then the folks at the bottom they said, well, you know, maybe I'm not going to win this little this little contest. They gave away I think a ticket like a hotel stay or something like that. But the people at the bottom said, well, I still want to sell this because obviously people are buying it. And so they just started, you know, every time they, they picked up the phone, they were pitching this new product. So, you know, that's, um, that was kind of a great way to kind of get the entire team focused, or the entire group of uh, salespeople focused on something new. Um, the, last, uh, the last little one I'll share with you is, uh, is for Comcast. So um, this is uh, Todd Goodbinder, the VP of Sales and Sales Operations over there, and they've got about a 2,000-person sales organization. So I've given you a couple examples, and this is for a large enterprise. Um, they had made a multi-million dollar investment in Salesforce. Um, it was essentially being used as an order tracking tool. So, um, and they wanted the managers to be using it regularly. And so their scenario was that they ran contests uh, through the core central office on a very regular basis. But the problem was that that's not helpful to your field sales manager out in Seattle who's got 20 people on his, on his or her team. And so what they did is they, they, they started using our program to put gamification tool um, right in the hands of the managers. And what that does, it allows the field managers to tailor the competitions to their own individual needs, which, oh, by the way, yanked them forward rapidly in adoption of Salesforce because they, you know, all of a sudden they could start getting benefit out of it. Uh, and the results were pretty tremendous. I mean, they saw 127% increase in the appointment set per day um, compared to when they had run competitions like this before versus running it through, through this application because everything is real time. Um, they also saw just massive adoption improvements because the salespeople were now, like, they, we tapped into that competitiveness with the leaderboards 
And then people understood that the system of record was Salesforce, and so that, that pulled adoption along. Um, in addition, they reported back to us that they've seen a, a, actually a reduction in staff turnover, um, which I never expected. And the, the main reason was because when they drove adoption and they had that data, they could use that data to then coach and train other people because now they were armed with the information. So by driving adoption, which we were kind of you know, one of the catalysts to do that, they're able to keep more people and retain their employees. You know, Bob, and I want to touch on that for just a second, is um, that's been one of the biggest issues that we've seen is that when we get involved with, with, with a client who already has Salesforce involved or some, or some CRM system, one of their biggest issues that they tell us is they don't have visibility to the right types of data. So they keep going back to their Excel spreadsheets that they've been using for years. Mm -hmm. And by incorporating some gamification, that's really dramatically improved the adoption of the sales, of, or it's improved the salespeople adoption of Salesforce, which then ultimately improves the collection of data, which then improves the reports, which then, to go to your point, improves the coaching and the ability to, man, to manage. Right, that. and the idea is that once you, so it's a great way to pull adoption along, and then, uh, and then where it gets really exciting is that then once you have the data and it's in there, now you can start using these ideas to accelerate and to get those things happening more often, which is what any company is trying to do. So um, we're running just a little bit over, so I want to make sure that before we um, close here we, that we get a few questions in because a few of them are starting to come in. Um, uh, Bob, one question that came in in the very beginning of this was from somebody, and the question is, um, we have work.com. How does Level 11 compare to work.com? So it's uh, it's actually a little bit different. I mean, so so they their product. I mean, that, so some see that as a having some gamification elements. Cause it's got badging, and you can do rewards and, and that kind of and set goals. Um, so actually, we're uh, we're gonna we're actually um, right now beginning a, a very deep integration and partnership with Work.com uh, in order to get the two products working very closely together. So um, keep your eye out in the coming months to see some uh, some pretty exciting announcements in this area. Um, and so if you look at it, like the, the work.com does not allow you to identify here's the specific behavior and how do I create you know, leaderboards and rankings out of them, um, which is what we, we bring to the table. Um, and then when you have work.com, you're able to do some of the badging and rewarding side of it. So marrying those two things together is going to be pretty exciting. Okay, good. Um, there's another question that came in, which is we see on the screen that you have Compete. What's Compete? So Compete is, uh, is our product. So Level 11 is a company, and Compete is the name of our app uh, for Salesforce, which you can find in the App Exchange. So that's, that's the name of our lead product. Okay, and then that just integrates easily with Salesforce? Yes, it's a, it's a fully native application. You, just, you can install it and get up and running, literally in a matter of like 15 minutes. It, just, it plugs right into Salesforce. It's all built uh, on the platform, so it's very easy to get going. Um, no outside API calls or anything. So. Okay. Uh, a few more questions are coming in. How do you reward those who are good performance, who are good performers, and already complete the fields prior to the competition? So um, I, th I think essentially, yeah. how do you reward those who who do what they're supposed to do? Who are already doing what they're supposed to do? Yeah. So there's there's a couple things. Like one that um, you know there are ways that you can if you identify pull those reports. You know you know there's two different scenarios. One is you can just plug that data in, so you, so you're talking about the handicapping earlier, and you can kind of get people started out to say, hey, you know, when this competition starts, you already have 57 points because you know you've already done that. Um, that's one way that some folks do it. Um, the other one is that you know is that you can target these competitions at very specific groups of people. So you know, some of the thing can be, well, I'm not trying to, you know, there's a maybe if I have 20 people in my sales organization or a thousand, you know, there's maybe this small segment that those are the ones that I'm trying to change their behavior. So you can point competitions just at them. So I generally recommend that against a one-size-fits-all for everybody and tailor and focus these, these little games or competitions on the people that you really need to drive behavior out of. Well, so on that point, um, when a company implements a gamification um, procedure or strategy, what's the culture like in the first few weeks? I mean, is there, is there a lot of emphasis on making sure that the culture adopts this well and is on board with this, or is it just rip off the Band-Aid and let's start? Um, I mean, I don't know that it's as dramatic as just rip off the Band-Aid, but I mean, we, we've, seen, we've seen companies, I mean, they'll, they'll, put this, they'll install this in place and they'll just say, okay, team, you know, really exciting. This week we're running a little competition around, you know, get your close dates updated or, who can have the most face-to-face -face meetings this week? And they'll they'll see 
immediate impact out of it, like right away. And so, like this idea is, it's not like a in, in, in a complex technology tool that people need to adopt and get used to. It's a competition, so salespeople are going to react to that very rapidly. Um, here's another question that came in, um, which is, uh, I don't drink coffee, so have you ever seen um, incentives as it relates to uh, trips? Or somebody else mentioned, what about an iPad? I mean, so more of those expensive types of incentives versus a $10 gift card. Yeah, like the $10 gift card is more like a kind of an example of it doesn't always, the prize doesn't always matter, but you know, I think it, it does uh, to a degree. So yeah, we've had clients give away like tickets to a you know, local sporting event. We've seen you know, trips for the weekend. We've seen dinner out, um, you know, iPads, computer equipment, all that kind of stuff. So it really depends on your own individual culture and what you think would get your team motivated. I think the main point is, you know, don't you don't have to kill yourself over how do I come up with the most incredible creative idea, and do I have to go pour a bunch of money into an incentive? And we have just seen in time and again that it's it's not as important as you think it would be um, if you run and manage the competition effectively. You know, and I think that there would also be an advantage to you know with a ten dollar gift card that gives you lots of singles, whereas maybe with a trip or a larger incentive that's one big home run that you have to kind of shoot for. Yeah, and that's that's a nice setup where you say, okay, the grand prize is a is a trip or a weekend away or something like that. But then you might say, you know, every and then everybody who gets more than twenty five points is going to get a ten dollar gift card. I mean, you could you can get creative like that. Okay. Um, okay, we have time for one more question, and um, and this comes from somebody who doesn't have Salesforce.com. Does this integrate with other types of platforms? Not at this point. So, so our um, the the our product that we have right now, the Compete app, uh, we've we've initially built specifically for Salesforce. Um, you know that may ultimately change, um, but uh, yeah, not not right now. But you could okay. certainly implement do these concepts. You, it would be a little bit manual, um, um, and I think you know hopefully share some ideas that give you idea you know ways to ways to do that. Okay, good. Um, well, there's more questions that are coming through, but I want to be conscious of everybody's time here. Um, if there's more questions that anybody has, um, uh, both my contact information as well as Bob's contact information is right there. Um, if you signed up and RSVP'd for this, for this webinar, um, you will receive a recording of it as well as the PowerPoint pre presentation. And just to confirm, Bob, you're okay with sharing the PowerPoint? Yeah, sure. That'd be fine. Okay. Um, Okay, well, Bob, we really appreciate you taking the, the taking the time. I know that I've learned a lot about gamification. I'm a big fan of it. Um, I enjoy competition. Maybe that's why I enjoy sales so much. Um, and gamification has brought has definitely brought in um, some of those uh, techniques that that we all kind of grew up with. Um, just yeah, cool. just before we close, I want to talk about some upcoming events that Galvin Technologies is having, as well as um, some events that Level 11 will be at. So Galvin Technologies has a has a series of events that's that's called a Customer Experience Management uh, Series, and um, this is the first of of, of several webinars. Um, but we also do field events as well. On June 5th in Indianapolis, we're going to be having a uh, event here on the northwest side of Indianapolis called A Morning in the Clouds, which is going to be focused on Salesforce. And we got we have presenters from Salesforce as well as some presenters off the App Exchange who will be coming here to talk about some of their stories. Uh, and then we have a really nice headliner as well from a big company um, who's going to be talking about how they implemented Salesforce throughout the global organization. Um, on June 19th, it looks like that level 11 is going to be up in Toronto. Uh, so if any of you are heading up to Toronto for the customer company tour, make sure you stop by the level 11 booth. On June 20th, just a day after that, uh, back in Indianapolis, we're going to have an event um, at the new hotel here called the JW Marriott, which is really nice. Um, it's how your website should attract, convert, and retain. Um, that's going to be an evening event. Um, should be should be a good one with many good speakers. Uh, on July 18th, we're thrilled to have um, some senior editors from NFL.com who are going to join us on a webinar, and we're going to get an inside view as it relates to how the NFL manages um, their content. So it should be interesting to to see the workings there. And then on August 1. Um, Bob, you're, you're going to join us for this one here in Indianapolis. It's called an evening in the clouds. And this is going to be an evening event um, in Indianapolis. It's going to be at Butler University. And this one's going to be uh, quite interesting because we're going to be learning about 
uh, various types of social media, but we're also going to be bringing in some um, Salesforce executives as well as um, some app some app exchange partners, just like Level Eleven. So, Bob, we look forward to having you here on on August first. Great. All right. Well, upon that, uh, we've run a bit over. We appreciate those who've stayed on um, for the extra nine minutes. So we hope everybody has a good week. And Bob, thanks again for all your time. Okay. Thanks, Gary.